the way this release works, it has a pivoting head, and the head has a hook on it that is essentially sliding on this picture a half moon. And when you rotate the release, that hook gets to the edge of the moon and falls off. And when it falls off, the hook opens up and allows the string to go. Yep. People wouldn't be able to take a hinge release and then take my, my trigger release and then be able to have the same position. Where right. You see, now right. I've built this to where they're the same. You can almost see it in their eye. You're like, oh, <laughs> shit, he's going to do it. <laughs> and it's from people that try to get it out on the tip, and then they're also trying to relax a totally. little bit. Just, people... My buddy Dwayne did that last week, and it completely <laughs> annihilated his bow, exploded it. Straight hand, curl the fingers, keep it in this rack of knuckles right there, and stay and firm. That's... I never really showed my cooking, even though I love doing it. But then once I got the Traeger, it was it was almost easier, so I could show people how easy it was. Yep. Once that started happening, and I could see people send me posts that would say, Dude, I went out and bought it and just followed that same thing you did mm-hmm. in your Insta story. I can't believe how much better I'm eating. And then all of a sudden I started getting all these success stories of people that were losing 50, 70, 80 pounds just because they're like, you know, we literally are trying to cook how you show. And yep. then we're just, you know. Dude, I've met, I don't know, four or five people in the last two weeks that are like, dude, John Dudley can cook. <laughs> like the dude can cook, you know. Sam Soholt was telling me about it. He um, would know because he's because I, I kind of take over the camp biatch role <laughs> <laughs> and now because I'm like, okay, I don't want to eat. I know I could I could cook good and we can eat good, but yeah, I'm not a big. I don't like necessarily doing the dishes, which is actually why I like the Traeger because. Your cleanup is like night and day different. It's like, yeah. can you vacuum pellet? Like, can you vacuum ash? Okay, yeah. you cleaned totally. up. Like, you're there. Well, let's let's get into this this podcast. I'm going to ask you some. My audience will be upset if I don't talk to you about bow and arrows. Welcome to the Gritty Bowman Podcast. We got John Dudley here, and we are at the Western Hunt Expo, <laughs> hanging out. And uh, <clears throat> so, I got a few questions for you, John. Around okay. setting up a new bow. Oh, yeah. So I got the uh, Hoyt Redworks coming. Okay. The Hoyt, the Hoyt Power Max. So I'm going to set that up. <laughs> uh, the Clash. The Clash. <laughs> I, I, so this last year, you know, so my draw length is about 28 and a half. Yep. Okay. And um, I think I want to draw, I want to pull about 70 pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, Year before I did eighty and I didn't like it. What didn't you like about it? Um, Wear and tear. No, no, it's easy for me to draw my draw that much weight. Uh, I think my draw length was at the time twenty nine. Yeah. So it was a little long. Yeah, a little on long side. And um, and I had trouble. Like it didn't feel as comfortable at full draw. Like I struggled at full draw just holding. And it probably had something to do with the extended draw length, which complicated it. Yep. But since then, I've gone down. I went down to this year. I shot around seventy pounds, sixty-eight, seventy pounds, and then I got down to twenty-eight and a half inch draw. And man, it feels just, it just feels good. Yeah. So I'm not sure if a higher poundage was had anything to do with it as much as it was being overdrawn. Well, they're both they're both correlated. But there's also um, just the feel of the different cams. Which did you shoot a turbo model with your shorter draw, or did you? I did the. I shot the 34, the Defiant 34. Okay. Um, which that actually has a really good feeling back wall. You know, some models in the past, the the positive and the negative, I guess, about Hoyt from just a basic archery consumer point of view is sometimes certain cam systems are designed for like really high performance and they're also designed for people that really like that feel a lot of targo target shooters that are crossover archers um, which most of the hoyt engineers are all passionate target archers and they're also real passionate bow hunters Mm -hmm. you know you see some of the guys these guys where they're going up they're still shooting a v-bar off they're I mean, they're almost essentially shooting a target setup without a lens in the scope and 
they've got a 12 inch rod on the front instead of a 30, but they're shooting like target accurate systems and they like that same feel of the cam as what they do when they shoot target, which a lot of target archers like a little bit more demanding back wall just because they like to be either 100% committed in their shot or if they're weak, they kind of want to know that they're creeping. So, and so when you say when you say that about the back wall, what does that mean? So when you draw the bow, the way the power curve works, so from zero, you know, you grab the string, that would be zero. Mm-hmm. As you pull it back, that weight goes up and up and up till it hits 70. On some bows, depending on the cam cycle, you know, or the draw cycle, um, some of them will hit that peak weight very fast and then they'll taper off and kind of dump off. Some of them gradually build in pressure, so it's almost like you're pulling 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, boom, and then it falls in. And then once you hit that back wall, there's also what the, what you call the valley, you know, the valley. And the valley is from when that cam breaks over to where the poundage is now decelerating mm-hmm. to what your holding weight would be, sometimes that valley is very short in length. So in other words, you sometimes you can pull a bow back and it pulls and it falls over good and you hit the wall and that feels good. But if you let up just a little bit, it wants to take it. And then, um, which there's, like I said, there's people that like that feel. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's also people that really like a lazy cam system. And I actually like a lazy cam system just because of bows that I shot a long time ago they had an e- you know a more efficient easier pull and then they fell over to where you know it was really you could almost just sit back at the back yeah. wall but the downside to that is when you start to make form flaws when that cam breaks over and you hit that that back wall if your valley is long mm-hmm. it gives you a lot more time to mi- where your mistakes show up down range because essentially a very relaxed and easy going back wall with a longer valley the string is still in contact with the face for a longer period of time so you know you look at a bow for example me with um, some of my target bows uh, when I when my release would click like in high speed footage um, at my draw length they would take about 16 to 17 thousandths of a second for the arrow to go from, you know, starting to move forward to passing the arrow rest, you know, 16, 17 thousandths of a second. Um, but for almost 13 thousandths of that time, the arrow is still sitting within the two inches of the face. Okay. Because it's those cams, you know, they're taking a sure. while to ramp up. And then they kick yeah, over. And then once they're going, it's a rocket. So what Target Archers found is, when you have that little bit shorter valley and maybe a little bit more demanding cam, any form flaw you make actually isn't as magnified because the arrow is clearing kind of the, this danger zone faster. You know, okay. and a lot of people's danger zone is their face. People that struggle with, um, you know, just having the odd end arrow that flies like crap or people that struggle with not being able to get the same type of tear through paper that, you know, maybe their shop is getting. A lot of times it's related to facial pressure, and depending on the... I would never think that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I've seen you talk about it. There's no bow laying around, but, you know, I would show you if you had, like, a compound bow, you know, all of the tension is on the string when the bow is at rest. So when the bow is at rest, the string is as taut as it's going to be. As you pull that back and it breaks over, you know, there's not a lot of weight on the string. Mm-hmm. All the energy and holding weight is transferred into the cables. The cables are holding that load more so than the string. The string, you can almost actually turn, you can yeah, actually, you can. you can turn it over. Don't try it at home, but you can turn it over, you know, and yeah. turn it back over if you, if you want to. And that's why it's so important to where, that's why I'm a big believer in like a release aid with less fingers on the, on the handle, because any type of change of angle with your release hand it automatically starts to change pressure on the string, which essentially the knock is in the string. So if you start to invert more Mm -hmm. one time, now all of a sudden you're putting more pressure and you can see all of a sudden your top cock vein starts to 
turned down because you're inverting too much. So what I found is by having less fingers on the on the release aid, I really feel like um, I'm able to have less Torque. torsional difference or variation. Yeah. Um, and again, that feel of that cam, the let off, the valley. Some people love just a dead solid wall where it's just like, boom, feels like you're literally hitting a cement floor. Some people like, um, which I actually always like to have a little bit of sponge because Mm -hmm. I'm a big teacher in pulling through your shot. So what I found is people that have these bows where they just hit these rock hard walls, when they're trying to pull through, they're also starting to make the front end kind of you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right. So by having a cam system that does have a little bit of give to it, I actually find helps me. And with the Defiant, you could put that limbs, you know, the, the extra stop yep. to where it was like rock hard. So the way I shoot, you know, I would actually find I would give myself a little bit more front end movement because I was on such a hard wall. Whereas if I took that out and just had a good solid wall, but also could build a little bit of pressure to come through. I felt like I shot a lot better, but I'm not a fan of like the, a lot of the faster turbo models that has, that have like 65% let off with a short Valley, because I just find as a bow hunter, when I'm nervous and tight, what I'm going to do more than anything is creep forward. I mean, so having something that kind of, wants to take it away from me and lurch forward. I don't really like that particular feel. The RX one this year is awesome because it's got one of the highest let off and kind of longest valleys of most any Hoyt bow that we've seen in the past. There might be a model or two where at certain draw links, it felt that good. Mm -hmm. But the problem is like with you, and this is one thing in the past that was important was, you know, um, most bow companies, they'll have two to three different cam sizes for one model. So, for example, like on your bow, you know, you could have had an A, a B, a C. There's a crossover between draw lengths. So let's just say your A goes from 25 to, to 28. Mm-hmm. The next one would go from 28 to 30. Right. You know? And then the next one goes from 29 to 31. So there's these crossover points, and what I found is when you're at the front end of that, what that cam is kind of Capable, optimized right. for, you start to almost get that hold that maybe it isn't doesn't feel as good as it does on another one. And a big Just reason because of where the cam turns mm-hmm, over, yeah, because essentially the cam is trying to break over and fall in and essentially all you're doing is stopping it sooner yes so you're not getting the full right you know you're not dumping all the way in whereas with this new cam uh that's on your red works um the new cam is really awesome because it actually has the longest spectrum of draw length options as any hoyt cam has had and like especially a high-end model some of the kid models have had wide draw length ranges but the efficiency between being in an a position or all the way in the longest position you still have the same feel um for let off which is a big reason why this new cam system is like one of the engineer's favorites because it's you know it's got a lot of good things going for it you know it's got a new split cable system at the bottom so it's actually for the first time Instead of having essentially two strings on one side of the center point of the cam, you know, you've got control cable on the outside, power cable on the inside, and then your string track. And then these two tracks are being pulled off to the side because of your cable rod. So essentially, you're automatically pulling that cam over because you need clearance for your arrow to pass by those cables. Mm -hmm. But with the new system... It doesn't have to be pulled over as far, and when it comes down, it splits, and one side now goes on the on the other side. So you're actually, your cam, you know, if you grab a new RX-1 and you hold that bow up, both cams are just dead center facing one another. Hmm. So you don't have 
the cam lean that you've had in the past. Yep. So, you know, some people would grab a bow and they'd pull it back and say, should I be worried about cam lean? And what you would find is sometimes it would have it a little bit more. Sometimes it wouldn't have it at all. And, you know, there's a lot of things that factor in there. Your washer spacing factors in how far back you're pulling it back because mm-hmm. obviously the further back you pull it the more and more pressure those cables are putting on the cable guard system yeah so you might see more a little bit more torsional turning or twist or you might have more flex in that roller guard depending you know if you have like a flexible roller guard mm-hmm. versus if you have a short draw where you're just like boom there just isn't near as much and the other thing too is the shorter your bow and you're trying to pull those strings over, it almost gives more lean when the bow's shorter because you're trying to make this angle at a, at a short span. Yeah, you don't have as much you, span to work yeah, if with. You can straight, if you can lengthen that out, when you pull it over, it's just not as severe mm-hmm. of an angle. So, you know, all that stuff starts to factor in. And what I tell people, um, even today, I mean, I'm a big Hoyt fan. I love, I love the fact that Hoyt has options for what I like, uh-huh. um, you know, there's there's people like Cam that love like a turbo model, and that's just what he likes. You know, he pulls back and you know he kind of locks in and he's holding back there. Versus, you know, I'm not a fan of right. locking in myself. And the other thing too is um, just position of your anchor naturally, like where I anchor. Um, well, I have a release in my hand, yeah, in my pocket. Um, so. When I grab my release aid and my hand is perfectly flat like this, I like to take the separation that naturally happens between the index finger and your middle finger. Yep. And that separation right there is pretty much what your That's jaw what needs to be right between. So yep. your index finger is under, your middle finger is over. Um, and then learning to really keep the hand flat and not fist. Some people start to try to get the release too deep and what happens is as soon as you start to change this position of your hand yep. when it looks like this that's not very comfortable no. to be on the side right. so a lot of people will then compress the front end so that they can actually dig that a little bit behind the jaw so one day they might be grabbing it flat like this and pulling back and coming over perfectly and then and the next, next shot day. they're a little there might be a little tense and they you know kind of Yep, grab that yep. thing with the fists and pull back and you know they're trying to get in there and then next thing you know front shoulders up elbows down they're dug in now the arrow's lower on the face now you have contact of the rear shaft on the chin right so now right. it's pushing out right coming in swinging through left as it goes out so there's just a lot of small things like that and honestly a lot That's of the it. people that uh, <clears throat> that I work with <laughs> that like my style of coaching is really guys that I can watch shoot for a day and find the one or two times where they make some of these minor mistakes. And then once, once you can identify the one or two things that people just do when they're not thinking about it Mm -hmm. and you say, okay, this is what you just did. And this is, this is where the arrows go when you do it. So, if you're putting arrows over there, this is probably why. Well, now all of a sudden you get someone that goes from making one mistake, you know, where say you're at the Total Archery Challenge and you make one shot and you're high left. And you're like, man, what I happened? don't know. And then you just get in this groove and you're like, man, I'm high all the time. I'm going to move my indicator pin. Right. And then all of a sudden you... <laughs> You go back to your normal, your correct way of doing it, and now all of a sudden you're like, man, I'm freaking hitting low now. Right. And you feel like you're just chasing your marks when yep. if you have the right coach that identifies your most common little mistakes. Mm-hmm. And what I've said is what separates the good archers from the greats are the the greats normally don't have flawless rounds. They have mistakes like everybody does. But... They're in tune with themselves enough to where when they make the one mistake, they know why. And they, and they don't let one eight turn into five eights in a row, move my needle. Now all of a sudden I shot, I missed five twelves high. Now I'm going for 14 rings because I'm 
six targets behind. Right. And then all of a sudden you just dig this vicious hole. So just learning to teach people to identify. And when I work with people, I can't do too many things at once. So a lot of times when I watch someone shoot, I think, what are the two things that I can tell them right now that are going to show them the most right now Mm -hmm. or in the next few weeks? And there may still be five or six little things I'd like to talk about, but I've just found that you start bringing too much into it. And I think a lot of problems that many archers have is they try to overanalyze every single little thing that I'm talking about. They're thinking about that on every single shot. And it, it's like, you know, it's just too much inform. It's information overload. Right. You know, I've had people that have told me, man, I just didn't shoot good. My, you know, my grip was wrong. I was like really tight in my hand a couple shots. And then I was like deep onto the string with my nose. You know, my peep was falling out. And I'm thinking, holy cow, man, if I was thinking about every one of those things <laughs> on every, sh- like, yeah. I wouldn't be able to focus on just addressing the target getting my feet right yeah. like going through a very simple routine so this this year um i shot better than i've shot in my whole life and i had aaron snyder the last two years helping me along yep like brian do this do that you know try that and aaron's not a very um like aggressive teacher like mm-hmm. in fact he doesn't really help you much at all you're out there <laughs> you're shooting and he's grouping tight and you're like all over and you have to drag. Sounds like Ulmer. Yeah, you got to drag help out of him. That was like, yeah, that was like how Ulmer was. It's like all of a sudden the one day he felt like to really just helping you, and you'd be like, dude, you could have told me that. <laughs> like three months ago. Three months ago. <laughs> and when I asked you, and he's just like, you asked me? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's how Aaron did. is. And and so I picked up pieces, and he's like, oh, you did this. Or I'll be like, I'm always reluctant to re- to, to, to to change my sights. My, because if I'm grouping one day and nothing's changed and now I'm hitting high left or I'm pretty sure it's me. It is. This is not the bow. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I can't, and I'll struggle with it. And some things though, that I figured out, um, switching to a Hoyt was new for me. Yeah. And, uh, what'd you shoot before? I I shot a Bowtech for a long time. Okay. So you grew up in the Northwest and. So you were used to a big Valley. Mm Mm-hmm. Big valley, hard dump, super hard wall, but with a long valley. Very. So you could just sit, you could hang back there for a while. Just sit there like forever. Yep. yep. I'm going to stalk your um, archery form while we're talking. <laughs> so <laughs> I, that's how I started, you know, to shoot. And then um, after a while, so then when I switched to the Hoyt, it was, it was new, really yeah. new. It felt really different. And uh, I never pulled through yeah so the way that i just be super relaxed and you know i'd hit the trigger mm-hmm. and uh my hand would just be sitting here just dead and i'd shoot and um so as i met aaron and he was teaching me entirely new principles uh it took me a while to get used to it right so then i started shooting with a hinge so i could uh, greg pool sent yep. me a bunch of them yep. so i started using some different hinge releases and Started playing You're with the those. first to see that baby. Ooh. That's coming out next week. You're, you're the first to hold it. Wow. Well, the production one, yeah. It's got a click in it right now for it is you know, everyone has their preference on on uh hook Interesting. It, hook adjustment. Yeah, it's really cool. Well I I started shooting it and uh and then I did uh, a bunch How of How did he teach you to shoot the hook? Did he um, teach you Making a fist and mo- and moving it. Okay, so what what or, he did was Aaron likes to use two fingers. Yep. Not three, oh, four. I like Aaron. So okay. just just yep. two fingers, and then Aaron does what you said with the flat and the hand kind of relaxed, more like this. Um, I actually kind of do it here. <laughs> we Carter called me and said, "Do you realize the influx of how many people have shot their?" their releases through in through their bow yeah and, and it's from people that try to get it out on the tip and then they're also trying to relax a totally. little bit just, people my buddy Dwayne did that last week and it completely <laughs> annihilated his bow exploded it yeah so yeah. Yeah. um and so that's why i say 
Straight hand, curl the fingers, keep it in this rack of knuckles right there, and stay and firm. That's, that's what I'm thinking. I yep. mean, it blew up his quiver, everything. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking, so, uh, but what I've done, what I did was I relaxed my index, index finger. finger to Perfect. shoot. Yep. Aaron actually pulls through. So he, 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 he rotates rolls, it. He rolls his fingers and mm-hmm. compresses. You know, pinky index middle, and then comes and through. pulls through. Yep, he's got a real strong pull through with the back tension. Yep. When I do that, I feel like I, I move the bow too much. Like I just move it yeah. a lot. Yeah. So there's um, and I know a lot of people watching who have, especially people who have shot hinge. There's those are two polar opposite methods of how I shoot. So I'm I'm a big, and I wrote articles probably. 15 or 20 years ago. Did you go to the Iowa or the Utah Bowman thing? Did no. You, you didn't go the other night, I, the bank winter? But I guess um, Denise Parker was there and Jay Bars were both there and uh, someone was talking about that. But I said, yeah, did you know Denise Parker was actually the first person to ask me to write about archery? She was. I mean, really? she was like, she was the visionary because she was the editor. She had taken that editor position for archery focus magazine uh-huh. and she watched me shoot some and and um she told me she said your technique is it really resembles olympic style form like uh-huh. your dynamics so she said you know do you want to start doing some articles and she said i'd really like an article on like how you shoot that release Yeah. Because back in the day, um, I could pull up a photo, but I shot a two finger. I shot two fingers on my release, um, but I shot like you're being taught. I shot with, you know, and I I think I wrote an article called Back Tension with Relaxation or Shooting with Relaxation. So what I like about shooting it the way that we're talking about, you know, pulling back with all the pressure on the index finger Mm -hmm. on a hinge because... The way this release works, if you're watching, um, it has a pivoting head, and the head has a hook on it that is essentially sliding on this picture a half moon. And when you rotate the release, that hook gets to the edge of the moon and falls off. And when it falls off, the hook opens up and allows the string to go. Yep. So as you rotate the release, that's what moves you know, the hook yep. on the moon. And they call Aaron's it. talked about the... He has in the past. Okay. So what I like about the relaxation method is a couple things. One is whenever you're in some type of a performance type mode, tension is not a friend. Yeah. You know, you want to, if you're tense and you're tight, then you're probably, especially like golf, archery, these are finesse sports Mm -hmm. and finesse and steadiness, like tension is not necessarily a big friend of that. So by understanding, okay, my release isn't going off, you also start to realize I'm tight. Like if you learn to shoot it where as you're slowly building pressure or maintaining pressure on the back wall, depending on how dynamic Mm -hmm. you are, you know, and you're relaxing that index finger and essentially you're letting that release pivot around the middle finger. If you're re- if you're relaxing and you're completely relaxed and things are moving and you're not locked in and just trying to aim, yeah, then your shots happen. But if all of a sudden you're sitting there and you're like, this isn't going off, this isn't going off, this isn't going off, you let down and you think, okay, freaking relax. You got to relax. Whereas, you know, it, the other method is making a fist. So I would without seeing Aaron shoot much, I would say he's probably in the pocket longer than me. He probably shoots a heavier setup overall because he's probably a little bit more of an aimer and he's actually manipulating the release so that it'll come off. You know, I think he's probably building pressure, having pressure, but also manipulating the release while he's trying to, you know, consciously trying to hold still. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little bit different than that. I'm not consciously thinking about holding still i'm allowing my movement without letting it worry me and i'm consciously thinking about how much i'm moving through and i want to execute through my shot because i found um 
with most compound bows, dynamic, continual pressure on the back wall. The more you're building and building and building on the back wall as it fires, the accuracy just sucks together even if the front pins are moving. And it's very similar to Olympic-style recurve um, shooting because, you know, if you've ever seen one of these, these guys are shooting, a lot of them are shooting a ring, just an open ring, and they're, you know, they're pulling back and they're doing their best to just let that ring, you know, they're looking through this circle yeah. at the at the gold or at the whole target, depending on the distance. You know, you've got yeah. these guys shooting at 90 meters. Their their metal ring, they could be looking at the majority of the target, but they're letting their subconscious center circles, center and center, mm-hmm. and they're just dynamically pulling through and allowing that float to happen. And as soon as that clicker goes off, they're just completely relaxing that hand and the strings yeah. going forward. So, I mean, our way of doing it and that way are very, very similar because you're, you're allowing front pin movement and yeah. you're accepting it but you're continually building and being dynamic on the back. See, with um, <clears throat> with uh, Phil Mendoza is there. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, at, he has a shop there, and, and I learn from Phil a lot too, and Phil, Phil shoots more like what I do, relaxing that, that index finger. Aaron has an uncanny ability to hold steady. Yep. Like just stupid steady. Yep. And, uh, and, and he uses the, his, his, uh, back Rhomboid. muscles. Yeah, yeah. Quite a bit. Um, and, and so where he's really pulling apart and when that mm-hmm. shot goes off, there's a big break. Yeah. Um, I, I've tried, but when I do that, I tend to introduce more movement Yeah. and I have a hard time. So the more I can just sort of push or push pull at, at a nice equal balance level yep. and relax that pointer finger and, and just keep pulling, I, I execute a much better shot. Yep. So when I went into the season, you know, I was never accurate at 100 yards. And this year, I was very accurate at mm-hmm. 100 yards all, all, all spring and summer and uh, leading into the fall. And <clears throat> feeling really good, too. And I decided I wanted to hunt with the back tension, uh, with the not the back tension, but the hinge, because yep. I felt really comfortable with it for the first time. Yep. So much confidence in it, because... You know, achieving a surprise release is not something I was able to do with it, with an index release. At yeah, all. and because I'm still so unfamiliar with with a hinge, I would definitely it would be a surprise every time. Mm-hmm. I never like manipulated it to the point where I could make it go off or anticipate it. Yep. So I went into the season and I felt really good and uh, had a couple of great successes on a mountain goat and an elk, and then. But then I got to that point where I was at full draw, and it wouldn't go off, 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 and I needed to go off. I needed to go off, mm-hmm. and then missed my opportunity. And then that happens a few times, and I'm like, why? And then, then in a moment of frustration, I'm like trying to get it to go off, get it on, and then I just snap, snap it. it. Yeah. And, and now I'm missing, you know. Yeah. And it started getting my head pretty quick. Yeah. And yeah, it, it will. What I realized later was... It's not going off because what you just said, my hand was like an iron claw. <laughs> yeah. John, I couldn't, yep. I couldn't, I sat there when I was at full draw and I had an elk in front of me and I'm, and it wouldn't go off. And I started to like, you know, the bull, the bull moved and now I don't have a shot anymore. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, what am I doing? And then I realized how much tension was in my hand. Now, adrenaline was pumping. My heart yep. was just raging. And, um, and I realized that, um, in certain situations, I'm calm, yep. but sometimes the buck fever or You're the jacked, adrenaline yeah. jacked, and I found that I had a really difficult time getting my 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 right hand to relax on the release, mm-hmm. which was a major problem because now every time it seemed like I was in a with a big animal in front of me, not like a small one where I'm like indifferent about it and I'm calm. I'm like I could take it, not take it. I, I tend to shoot great. Yeah. Then when I have something come in front of me that I'm like, okay, this is it. Stakes are higher in my mind, you know. I would introduce the iron claw <laughs> and then not be able to make the release go off. Well, actually, um, I think it was before Rogan's um, elk hunt with Cam. We were talking about um, kind of shot placement. I'd posted that picture of the what I call the golden triangle for arrow placement. And I 
and kind of Joe had saw that video and he called me about it and he's just like, you know, I really want to make, I really want to make a perfect shot on film. And I just said, what you need to do when you know that moment is close, as I said, you have to just start doing rehearsal in your mind. I'm like, rehearse it. And that's one thing for me that I've learned to do with animals is just get to the point where when you know that moment of opportunity is coming, I'm like in visualizing exactly what I want to happen. I want him, I want him right here. He's going to be broadside. This is how, you know, you're not just saying I want to make a good shot because mm-hmm. that's too vague. Like you need to really think about, I'm going to freaking, you know, my lane's right there, holes 40 yards, 40 yards. It's red pin, red pin. That thing's going to, you know, I'm going to have a little tremor. I know I'm going to right behind that shoulder and I'm just going to, just feel that release move and just feeling it moving and feeling it moving and that's when it's going to go off. And you have to like, you almost have to take this magnifying glass and just bring it onto how you're really going to feel instead of just, you know, when, when we talk visualization, some people are almost too vague. They just say, oh yeah, I, you know, I'm just picking a spot and I'm just going to hit them there. I mean, you really need to bring your other senses into it and um, when I work hmm. with students for the first time, I really try to find the time where I feel like they've made the best shot that they've made. And I really try to draw them back to that. And I'm like, how did you feel on that shot? And then they'll say, yeah, I mean, it was pretty good. And I just say, well, no, like, tell me everything about it. Like, hmm. I want to know. And I would just, they would say, they'll say one thing and then I'll draw it out. Okay, well... You know, you said the pin, pin was steady. How steady was it? You know, where did it move to? Which pin did you have? You know, what the bow sound like when it went off? How much movement do you feel like you actually had in that shot when it came through? And then when they would describe and paint this whole picture, I'd be like, okay, that is now your baseline. Every time you want to make a perfect shot, I want you to think about all those details because all of those is actually what build up to make the perfect shot. It's not, it's not just picking a hair and letting it fly because yeah. that's way too, you know, like you said, even though you had the perfect release and you pulled back and you were on them and you were amazing that you were patient, which that's a huge step. Most people just taking a hinge release into the hunting woods, that's a huge step. But the fact that you knew it well enough to where you were tight, if you would have thought about the fact, you know, okay, you know, we're not going to be tight. I'm going to be loose on this index finger. I'm going to relax that finger, keep my tension moving. Elbows coming back, index fingers going forward. Yep. Because you essentially want this to move at the same as you're moving that. Like that's, I try to vision myself locked, and as I start to move, the finger will relax. So too. As you're pulling through, your index fingers relaxing. Yep. At the same time. I'm trying to as as I'm especially if you're like battling gusts where, you know, all of a sudden you've got a calm zone. You're like, okay, I need to go as you're going, you know, as this is moving, this is moving. And if you learn that to do them at the the same pace, really good things happen. And you actually really start to learn what I call is, I call it a cadence. You learn, you learn like your stroke. I refer to it. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when I shoot in live feeds, I'm trying to find my stroke in my rhythm. Yeah. And the reason I post them is because I actually really want people to pay attention to that. You know, the last, um, two, the last two live sessions that I've posted of me practicing have actually been with that release, but it wasn't a finished one. It was a prototype version, but people are like, it seems like you're, you know, it seems like you're moving back, but you're also like really your hand is changing. And so I have to say, okay, yeah, this is a hinge release. So it's not like I'm shooting a trigger where I'm locked and I'm bringing my thumb to the back and everything is fixed and I'm pulling through in one unit. Mm-hmm. With that release, you know, I'm essentially starting there, but then I'm, you know, I'm relaxing the index finger. So I'm allowing that release to pivot around the middle finger. So it's... It's tough because there's four different types of release aids. You know, there's a a trigger release, there's a hinge release, there's a tension release, which I don't think I have on me, and then there's a wrist strap release, you know, a caliper release. And all of them are, all of them can give you the same execution, but 
they're all, if you do them right, they're all slightly different. Yeah. I mean, that's the truth. They're a little bit different. You know, I um, use the wrist later in the season mm-hmm. because uh, of ha- the next problem I had with the hinge in the hunting woods was with wind. Yep. And, <clears throat> and uh, especially because I'm not fast with the release, getting yep. it to go off. Um, and then when, when I am more nervous, the adrenaline's pumping, it got a lot harder to relax. And I was trying to. But it just flat out is difficult. Physiologically, my adrenaline's going, mm-hmm. and it's hard. And so I'm working on it. But I switched to that. But then when I was in the wind, I was like, okay, I'm tired of trying to shoot a hinge in the wind. Yeah. Like, I'm tired of it. I'm frustrated. Because you find your way slower? Yeah, and then right when it's about to surprise me, I get wind gusted. And then it gets in my head, like, this might surprise go off at the wrong moment. Yeah. And so... I got to a point where I want to command it. Like, I want to tell this wind to go off. Like, (laughs) the the command. You want to punch it. I want to punch it. Yeah, okay, let's let's just simplify things. (laughs) Command's too long. You want to to rip it, so. I do. Okay. And and so I'm in that moment, I'm like, okay, I want to rip it. And, um... And, and man, do you feel like a turd when you miss oh, and you know no. you ripped it. You're like, dang it, I punched it. Yeah, that's right. So I'm, I, uh, so my, my plan later in the season was, Brian, get your ass closer because, you know, I can punch in 20 yards <laughs> and, uh, drill it, you know, okay. but I have a hard time. Like I literally, it was a problem with a couple of, of these shots that were, um, in the wind. So I was in. I was in Alberta, yep. and there was like 40-mile-an-hour winds, 50-mile-an-hour winds. And um, and then I had another experience in Montana with elk where the wind was just 70 miles an hour, and then it would die down to 30 or 40 and then come back. And there was a couple of spots, depending on where you were on the mountain, where it was just like it was impossible, it felt like, to take a shot. Yeah. And then spots where, okay, now I'm in a little pocket and the wind's died down. It was still there. Yep. And so it was, it was, it was frustrating, John. Well, it is, but, you know, sometimes in those conditions, too, you have to really... I've had times where I've been in those situations where I'm like... Do I shoot? I don't... Like, this is a this is a Hail Mary. Yeah. Even if it goes off when I want to, like, even, even with me and building ballistic charts at times for Easton, I couldn't tell you what to do in a 40, 50 mile an hour wind. Yeah. Because it's like, okay, length of arrow, weight of arrow, speed speed loss at distance you know you talking what that arrow is going to do at 20 versus 64 i mean right. there's so many variations where i've had times where i'm like i can't make it happen right now and actually the the film that um kill cliff just released today of our f- oh yeah yeah uh, it, yeah it, it, they released it about an hour before i came i gotta i gotta see it dude have you not seen it yet no i'll, I'll let you watch it in a minute i've got it on my phone awesome um but what's cool about it i guess it's spoiler alert too but um, I don't, I don't connect and I shoot, which I, I'm actually kind of pumped to show because that goes against what, you know, everyone thinks I hit things all the time, you know, I'm, and the reality is if you hunt enough, you're not going to. Yeah. And there were several elements there that just, regardless of how seasoned you are, it was, it was like more of a challenge than what I was prepared for because, well, there was a few things. One, one of the days the wind was so strong, even even having one at 52 yards, it's like I cannot guarantee where I'm going to hit this thing. And it's not like, you know, sometimes if you have a smaller animal and you put an arrow in it, you know, it's going to go down. But, you know, you also need, you know, if you're in Alberta and you're in wide open crop ground for exactly. miles and miles, you're going to see where it goes. You're going to be able to keep eyes on it. but you know, when you're in the French Alps and the, and it's bedded right on the top of a rim rock, and it's 52 yards across, so it's gonna it's, it might take us 40 minutes to get that to, 50 yards, yeah. and then where did where did it go? go high low? Did it bail off? So now it's just a waste, and we've you know, and it's just like this was a lot of work getting here, but we got to back out because it's just not you know it's I can't as much as I want to think I can do this, I can't guarantee that. 
the shot's going to be good enough to where if it bails over that edge that I know it's down in 50 yards. So there was one of those situations. Then um, the next situation was all the snow then freezing to where it was crunch. And, you know, if you're trying to film something, and I was really wanting to hunt with my buddy. I mean, I was there with Andy, and I wanted to be there when he got his. I wanted him there with me when I got mine. Right. Um, So, I mean, there's two of us hunting. There's a guide, which you have to have by law, that has the allocations. And... Then there's a camera guy, and it's just like, you know, four guys walking on crust to a mountain animal. Yeah. It's like every time, even if we'd spot them, we'd try to sneak as much as we, and we'd hope the wind was covering or, you know, there'd be enough background noise. But then all of a sudden you get there, and they're just like, okay, Bigfoot's coming over the top of this mountain. I'm going to wait and see what it is. <clears throat> and they're looking at you, and the shot that I that I had, that – Shammy had actually he knew something was coming but he hadn't like pinpointed us to right. where he knew like what it was and there's wild russian boars up there in those parts too and we encountered several so when they move through there's a lot of slate sliding and crunch you know there's crunching and stuff like that so you know they look at you just long enough to to identify you know they know they know they could hear and you know he was looking like something's up there and i'm trying to just come around a tree enough and uh you know may, try to figure out the cut which the my cut was off um i actually made a pretty stupid mistake i didn't realize that in the archery mode for my rangefinder it would only automatically compensate to like 30 degrees as a max yeah and i was like i actually made the shot so weird and I, huh and I, yeah and i'm ranging and i go i said dude Okay, I said, if I take this off and I range, it's this distance. And I said, I know standing here that, you know, that's like 20%. If I'm going to guess, like, I'm hoping this would have just been bang on. Yeah. But I said, this thing's like four yards off yeah. at least. It's bad. And I actually called um, I called back and called the factory because it was, it was uh, in the afternoon when I whiffed. And I actually called back here from the mountain, and I said, "Hey, how how accurate is this automatic compensation?" And then they said, "Well, what model do you have?" And I said, "Well, it's a little bit older model." And told them they just said, "Oh, it maxes at 30. And I said, "Well, does it like give you an indicator? Like, hey, we're telling you this is 30 percent of that number, but we're not at you know we yeah. might not be right." And so I was. I literally even, I thought I made a great shot, Mm -hmm. but I went over the top of it. And, you know, that's just, it was a learning curve. Dude, uh, we did a podcast with Phil Mendoza and Aaron Snyder where where Phil drew a tag in uh, Colorado for sheep, bighorn. Mm -hmm. And he he was taking like a 70-yard shot, 60-yard downhill, you know. and With the, the cut or? He, the first time he went and he's, you know, He's a he's a good archer, yeah. you know. Phil is and uh, won some competitions, and he's he, you know he's he's a good shot, and <clears throat> and he missed with the rangefinder, and just didn't know, missed like three times, and so he went home and he talked to Tim Gillingham, um, Aaron, and they knew the rangefinder was off. You know, at the greater that distance and then the steeper the angle, the more off it is. The oh, algorithms yeah. Well, don't yeah, work. Yeah, that's the problem. Mine mine was, I mean, I don't talk about the length of a shot, but you'll you'll hear it. Yeah. Know it's a it was a bomb. So you know? he went back in and um and they actually he made cut charts. He actually climbed up, got those shots, ch- tested, saw where he was at, figured out what he needed, put mm-hmm. it on a he put it on his forearm, or he did it on like a football band, yeah, like a quarterback sleeve. Yep, and yeah. then because no, none of the range. Then he went out, and then, yep, and he had like a a long bomb shot like that, and he knew because he figured it out with his setup at home, and drilled it. Yeah, you and, get over eighty yards, <sighs> and one yard on a you know a forty kilo animal. Mm-hmm. One and a half yards at at eighty miss. at eighty with a hunting setup, you're over its back. Yep. 
I mean, it's 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 a big big deal. And he was freaking out because the first few, couple few times he missed, he felt he was really upset. So Phil ranges this thing and he takes like an eighty yard shot with his last arrow that he brought with him because yeah. he's just like in his head, he's just like, I don't know how I'm missing. And then he drilled it, and he's like, what? So it wasn't until they got home later yeah. that he realized, oh, well, his rangefinder isn't calculating it correctly. You're off by multiple yards. So what I do is um, you can buy um, a cheap inclinometer on Amazon. And this is when I used to shoot competitive field archery. This is how I learned. Okay. So you can literally mount this. Um, if you type in inclinometer on Amazon, there's one called Sun Company uh, 201-F. And it's literally this Levo gauge. And you have to mount it so that it's perfectly horizontal to the top of your rangefinder, Like... Say this is my rangefinder, I would have that stuck on the side right here. Yeah. So that as you range with your, if you're right handed, you want it on your inside. So you can literally get to your thing and you can come out and look at where your bubble's sitting for angle. Okay. Then what I did was I laminated my cut chart and put it on the other side. So I actually have a little cut chart um, that would go on the other side. So I would just look and, okay. 42 degree you know 42 degrees Mm -hmm. 22 percent cut so then it's you know a lot of those cuts are easy math you know you look and you're like okay boom there it is and that's back in like you know the bushnell rangefinder days Uh and you know and then the the first nikons where they didn't have um angle compensation that was it all of our rangefinders for like top level field archers we mounted inclinometers on the one side, cut chart on the other, so it'd be easy to be here just, looking at that speaker. Just literally hold it there, or you could just look over the top like this. Yeah. And then come to the side. Okay, I'm sitting at 42. Then look over here, uphill, 42 degrees, and you've got your chart. I actually have I have my chart on my phone, too, for like... And that's what I was upset about is I'm like, man, I should have just... If I would have known this, I would have just had it on rifle mode where it at least tells me the true yardage. The true yardage. And that's one thing you can do. Almost all the range finders will actually give you the angle, mm-hmm. but not necessarily do the math. Right. So you can literally do the angle and see, you know, on your range finder, okay, 47 degrees. Then if you put that small laminated cut chart on the outside, uh, I'm going to try to find this while we're talking because yeah. there's really, it's not that big of a table and I can tell everybody listening, they could almost write these down. Yeah. But that was, uh, honestly learning archery without all the gadgets is a valuable tool that's going away. It's kind of like, in my oh. opinion, it's, it's a lot like photography because Sharon and I did a lot of photography for many years. We did a lot of photography for Realtree and, uh, we never learned post editing. Yeah. So all of our shots and like our POP stuff that were like in stores and shields and dicks and mm-hmm. you know, Realtree offices, like all this stuff, we learned to capture the shot by navigation of the control on your camera right and not like, just in raw and then you fix it in post yeah i mean <laughs> nowadays i go on photo shoots with guys um like taylor larson from hoyt mm-hmm. we've been on things where you know he'll just take a picture and he'll be like oh yeah dude that's sick and i'm like <laughs> he's an dude, let's, and- <laughs> yeah let's let's work that um let's maybe hit that white balance a little bit and he's like Oh no, dude! I like it just like that because I can pull all that out and zip all that up yeah. and bring it in Lightroom, and I'm just like, man! All I would ever do is like open it and then be ready. Resave <laughs> 2.0 <laughs> megapixel, 300 DPI. Okay, that one can email. Yeah. Keep the 14 meg to like drop on an SD card to send to someone. Right. But yeah, nowadays, you know, and and I really feel like there's amazing photographers and stuff, but. If you learn, like you talked about Sam. Sam's a great Mm -hmm. photographer. Sam learned he can navigate the manual system of his camera. Yep. I handed him mine, and I'm like, and he just captured awesome stuff. And that is a a super, super valuable talent that photographers need to still have. Archers still need to know, okay, 
if someone took away my range finder yep or if i couldn't if i got in a weird menu and i couldn't figure out what menu i'm in how the heck do i make a shot off a cliff like how right. do i do it i love like garmin and i love onyx maps and but aaron and i that aaron onyx especially maps was dynamite aaron, i actually don't know how to use it but my one of my guides had it and i'm like yeah. dude this thing's yeah. so awesome aaron has hammered home though paper maps and compass mm-hmm. and all of that stuff utm grids and and now i i hardly can go out i i hate going out without my map and compass yep because it i use it more than my gps now yeah and um but in the past i didn't i didn't work like that and i think it's a lost skill again because people are so used to growing up with a gps it is and one of the one of the real lost skills in archery is truly learning ballistics like i look at I know some military guys that are that were just dynamite snipers, but those guys were doing those guys were learning how to be a sniper before ballistic charts were so at the ready. They were literally learning their caliber so good to where they knew, okay, if I'm at my three oh eight, this is why I like this load. I can shoot at mm. this distance. Here's my hold off. I know, you know, if I can right. check when. I mean, you learn that system flawlessly inside and out. And that, I think that's why at least some of the snipers that I've talked to that are, you know, guys that grew up pre like digital phone mapping era, they stayed on the same caliber all the time. And a lot of them stayed on same calibers within like community mm-hmm. because they weren't having to. Ha- have so much variance in information right you know you were literally learning you know if you were with a guy that was just super familiar with a 308 and a 200 going at this velocity they could just literally tell Tell each other exactly what they needed to do like with me you know i remember i was with a guy one time and uh we came into a hunt in montana and the group before us had antelope hunted, and the outfitter had told us, hey, I said, did anyone get one? He said, no. They said they had some opportunities, but no one got a shot. Um, so we're driving around, and he's it was a DIY hunt, but mm-hmm. it was just trespass. Like, he gave you permission to trespass, but you were on your own. All he did was drive you around the perimeter and say, don't go outside to any of these things, because this is our yeah, place. Yeah, this is our spot. So... As we're driving around, here's this antelope out there, and he's hobbling along. And, you know, I pull up my glass, and I said, that thing's got a hole in its, like, <laughs> through its back ham. And he's like, what? And I said, yeah. It's, I said, that thing's been shot, you know. And someone had shot it and not said anything about it, you know, and it was still kind of walking around. And one of the guys in the truck's like, you know, I think I said we should just is it, is it would anyone be happy with that thing because it wasn't that big of a goat and and a guy actually a hunter that we had from Denmark said you know I would I would love to shoot that thing so we went out we started stalking it and it was still an antelope that was smart and it mm-hmm. it went around for a while and then it it beds down under this pine tree and I mean it was in like a big indention so we kind of could get to the sagebrush on the top, and it was literally right under this tree, and there's yeah. just no way you could get any closer. And it was a, a stupid shot, but it was also injured. So I, uh, I told the guy, I said, how heavy is that arrow? And he said, oh, it's 509 grains. And I said, okay. And I said, how fast are you shooting? And he told me. So then I, you know, I said, can I see your, your gapping? Because he, yeah. he had a scale. So I kind of gapped, 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 and I thought, okay. I held it up, kind of put the his bottom pin like on the goat, and then kind of rolled the mill dot back and saw where that climbed on that tree. And then I just thought, okay, well, I'm gonna I need to add ten percent on that. So I like walked it up the tree, yeah, because he needed like sixty five yards more than what his fixed pin sight would do, yeah. And I just said, okay, do you see that? third limb from the top where it comes in i said there's a pine cone cluster and he said yeah and i said i think your bottom pin right there is going to be freaking close and he's like okay and i mean he was a world level field archer he pulled back shot breaks 
And I'm just sitting there watching. He goes, where did it go? And I just see this thing just pinwheel, just smashes really? this thing. <laughs> and it flops around. And he looks at me. And he's like, I can't believe it. He said, I would never shoot an animal that far. And I just said, well, n- no one would. Yeah. No one would. I said, but what choice do we, you know. It's He's already wounded. Yeah, and I said, that, you know, I said, this is, you did a great thing. You know, you did a, a great thing. But he was just like, how did you figure that out? And I said, just all the years of printing scales. Yeah. And just having a scale where I'm and shooting 280 feet a second. And then, you know, back in the old competitive days, I'd be like, well, how much advantage is there if I'm shooting 283 or 284? So then you get the same ballistic arrow and then you start to find that scale and you start comparing scales and then i'm like okay four feet per second is nothing like on this scale mm-hmm. it's i can literally move my sight an inch forward or an inch back and then i'm back to the same scale so learning those types of maths are so like that's that's going to be a lost um, yeah aaron kind of a lost knowledge aaron's good at that and, and i've seen aaron um like they have those trick shoots, like at Total Archer Challenge mm-hmm. and things. If there's a tree or a hill or anything behind it, where Aaron can elevate, elevate and something. use something else, <laughs> he can ballistically drop that arrow right where he needs it. Yeah, and that's a craft. I mean, that's and he can do it within two, three arrows, like that fast. Just and walk it in. He was shooting with Barklow, John Barklow, uh, at the tack in Montana, and they had a. It's Aaron's classic thing. You're supposed to how's go to the John, next. How's John as a shooter? He's damn good. Dang it. He's he um he asked if I'd give him lessons. He's, so I agreed. Yeah. He, he's John. probably gonna he's probably humbly just wanting to come out and stomp <laughs> stomp me in my backyard. No, he's actually um very, very good. That's um, great. I was surprised. There's so many good who he's there's so many good not talking archers. about it. I, yeah. But uh he Aaron would be like you're supposed to go to the 80 yard pen for the shot yeah. and Aaron would stop on the road and okay. It looks like a safe <laughs> shot. Sounds like me. 150. Okay. Let's see who can hit it. And, and they'll pivot. He pick something where there's a tree behind it and, or it's a big moose or, and, and, and the, but yeah, uh, he's, he's really good at that. Um, he, he'll joke around about, um, how important it is Look to get free baby. arrows whoa dude <laughs> Look i just i'm looking that I'm, that was like og two finger right there <laughs> I, I don't I just, even recognize i just showed brian a picture of me like my rookie year how tour. old are you there i think i was like 18 Jeez. yeah shooting the two shooting the two finger all locked into the pocket just so relaxing that index finger i'm curious how do you how does a guy choose which release to use? Like, honestly, I think I like to shoot them all at different times. And that was one thing I was going to ask you is, did you always shoot just one hinge or did Aaron ever set you up with having multiple <clears throat> ones in your had, pouch that, that were slightly different in speed? I had three, three hinges, um, of, uh, different, Speeds. Levels of hot. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Um, they were HTs. Okay. And then, uh, and then I used uh, one with a safety, the sweet spot safety. Uh, so I used that at but, first. But did you have some that were like yes, mul- the same exact, but Ex- one yes. one would go hot and one you know would maybe not go. Did you Ex- ever shoot yes. one that did not even go? Yep. Okay. No, I did not do one that didn't go, but I, I used one that took a lot to go off. Yeah. And so it kept me honest, and I switched back and forth. I never knew which one. I would use them constantly back and yeah. forth, and they there was no differentiating. I didn't know yeah. which one I was using each time. So, yeah, that's what I did. And because that really keeps you honest. It, that's it, kind of the next level of shooting a hinge is not just learning to shoot a hinge i think if you do that for a lot of people that's a very very big step but when you start to shoot it a lot a lot you know when it's going to go off you know then and that's that's like when you say which should i shoot i think some people where they really want to just learn patience of being there 
and maybe trusting some movement and getting that surprise shot, like the hinge is going to be a great thing to get you there. But then also you're going to realize after six months to a year that your brain is understanding exactly right. how much. And then, and then what, what does it, Andy use? He shoots a silverback. Yep. What does Rogan use? Rogan uses a silverback um, for training, and then like when he's hunt, like when he's hunting, um, where I, th- I actually I can't remember. I thought he shot a. I don't remember if he shot a elk with the silverback. He shot um. He shot a hog with me in California um, with a silverback, and I mean just dynamite pulled back let off that safety just sat there holding that pin tight just really? pulling through and i love seeing that like if someone shoots a tension release and they're able to make a shot um the editor of peterson's bow hunting christian berg he had buck fever really bad to where mm-hmm. it just like decimated his archery year That's how david brinker and uh has he, been. he came to me and said i, I i'm throwing the towel in what can i possibly do do and i just said well let's go back to scratch so we went back to you know i gave him a string gave him that silverback started talking to him about here's what you need to do taught him a tension release and then fast forward one year later he i think he shot like three white tails one of them was with me on film just i mean money shot right through the heart drew back acquired the target let off as the deer's kind of walking he's following stopped him and just built pressure built pressure boom just perfect shot so i think people can shoot any of them it just depends what stage you're at if people are just not trusting on having their pin on the target and being able to move then a hinge or the silverback attention release is where you have to be because that's that's one mental block but once you really start to like almost learn the speed of your hinge too well then and but you're you're good at you know when it's going to fire but it's not just that you know when it's going to fire you actually um know how much movement involves but Mm -hmm. you're comfortable staying on the target as all that's happening then you can move into a thumb release and a thumb release even though it's fires at the same pressure every time how you set up on that before you're or how you preload your back, or how you preload your finger to the trigger, or how aggressive you are in your pull, you can make that release feel like multiple releases just because it's a lot harder to like really understand how much till it fires, how much till it fires. So there's different huh. stages to it. But one thing that I was going to tell you that I think is really important, um, not just for you, but for really for anybody is getting to the point where you really start to practice like and i from what you've talked about i don't know if you could be able to tell me you do this but do you ever just practice timing like not really going not going to shoot to say i'm going to shoot league tonight or i'm going to shoot a 300 i mean do you ever just sit there and shoot to where you're like i want to just feel like this stroke is the same all the time and i'm not worrying about and it's not like blank bailing. Like blank bailing, as in my mind, that has a different use. A different use. But to be able to be on a target, not necessarily worry about how you're shooting, but like this time of year when I indoor shoot, mm-hmm. when people say, well, why are you still almost training? All I'm trying to do is ingrain a stroke and a timing and a rhythm that I can just get to the point where it's so repeatable to where. I have to try to find that same pace, even if it's windy. Like you were talking about windy. The best shooter, the best compound shooters in the world, the best in the world, a huge majority of them shoot a hinge release. And I'm talking wind, tournament, gold medal matches, money, it doesn't matter. And Mm. what they've learned is get that pin on and go. Like commit and go. You know, this shot has to be. Three to seven, three to seven, three to seven. You well, know. Uh, to, to answer your question, I would say the answer is no. Yep. Because I felt like what you're describing with the stroke mm-hmm. would cause me to anticipate when the release is going to go off. And then and then it'd be no different than having a trigger I'm pulling and punching. 
you know. So I I kind of just get it back and just slow. I, I really focused on um, just keeping the pin mm-hmm. floating where I need it to be and relaxing. That's yeah. kind of all I've done. I haven't done it for t- time or for a certain with like to get a, a, a feel, but I, I did with a certain with a hinge as I got closer to the season, I felt that that would be important. And for two or three weeks, I got to where I could get through the shot way faster mm-hmm. than I did. So and I guess if I think back, it's kind of like that, but I would, I would basically just get to the click in that hinge, yeah. like get it pulling, pulling, and it would just click. And then I knew it was about to go off, and then I just relaxed. It felt so good. See, that's why I'm not a fan of the click. Yeah. Because, because the click is like an indicator of I'm on the edge. I mean, you know. You know. Right. And, and, I, and so I had some that didn't have. I only put the click back in. After a little while. Just, perf- just before I went hunting because I, I was afraid, John, that, uh, you know, of I wanted to be able to have more control over the shot on a live animal. Yeah, I, I get it when people say that, but I've just found that the more you want to have control, the more you don't. It, 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 the more it takes control of you. I mean, it it's this weird thing. I wish I could find this. It takes so cut much chart. mental discipline, dude. Crap yeah, me. I'm like going nuts. <laughs> I'm like, where's my cut chart? I know I've got it here. I'm, it, I mean, I'm gonna find it before we're done. But it's there's a lot of different things that training is good for. Blank bailing has a purpose. Shooting indoor rounds, you know, has a purpose because it really helps helps you understand like what level you're shooting at. Shooting at a long distance has a purpose because it does identify when you're making a mistake. It magnifies mistakes. But a lot of people, and you know, I talk a lot about shooting with the string and just training with the string. And actually, part of the reason why I haven't brought this release out yet. This hinge. Is, yeah, because I don't want people that have heard about a hinge to buy it without really knowing. So I'm finalizing a video to where everyone that buys one gets a link to the video to where they see taking the release out of the box. Here's how you adjust it. Here's how, If you want to click, here's how you do it. Here's what a click does. Here's what not having a click does. But then more importantly than that, um, have you seen the right release? The little str- the trainers that are, it's a wood handle with an adjustable, you can adjust the length of the cord so that you can just practice on, you know, hand position or coming oh, through your release. I know what you mean. Yeah, I actually, um, I'm doing a knock-on version of those, and they should be in this next week. So I want to. So you can and, practice this in the yeah, house. Yeah, and just... they're, they're really affordable. So I, you know, I'm going to actually do the video of, here's how you learn. Don't, don't try to pull a hinge back with your bow the very if you don't really understand the function it's always yeah fun to watch someone try to do it for the first time <laughs> especially if they've got like that sort of buck fever or that you well, know yeah they that, punch it yeah those are the people that put the put the their release right through the back of their riser because they end up just so i took Dwayne out and letting go Dwayne to no limits with phil and i and, I, and after a lot of i'm like okay now try this back to he wanted to try the the hinge he pulls at phil's shop and then as he's going through and i'm like okay just start pulling pulling you know relax that finger well he in that moment um when it needed it to go off like the body just wants the arrow to <laughs> yeah, go uh-huh. and it's not going he was, he was sitting too good like he was like this is in the middle as it's ever gonna be exactly yeah and so he just was like go off and it didn't go off, and then boom, and he shot the arrow into the rafters and exploded everywhere. Yeah. So we knew we had a big problem, uh, and so we got uh, Dwayne started practicing in a you know with that hinge. I'm like, dude, you just had a mental collapse uh-huh. here because you were holding, you, you needed it to go, and you just forced it, you know, to the point where. So he got the hinge, and he'd been practicing for about three weeks each day but he got into a position where he got last week or so he got back and uh it wanted it to go off and it didn't he just let go (laughs) just let go i've never i've never (laughs) actually done that but i've i've seen it and i've you know i've kind of seen i've you can almost see it in their eye you're like oh 
shit, he's going to do it. <laughs> and then you're like, don't let, and then that's it. Like it's too late. Um, well, I guess if I was able to give you homework, I would yes. say, um, and maybe I'll send you one of these. Um, I'll send you one of these for you to play with. But well, I'll see you tonight, won't I? Yes. I don't know if I'm going to have time to go back to my hotel or I, I would have brought you one. But um, a really good habit is carrying your releases in your pocket. Yeah. I I mean, I You're almost gonna, always. You sound like a nerd. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a yeah. And, you know, and. In a cool if you're, way. If you're, playing, if you're an archer. Yeah, if someone sees you playing in your pocket, <laughs> it's just my release. Yeah, sure. It's sure. got a circle. Yeah, sure. Okay. Exactly. Um, no, I really, learning hand position and preload to a trigger before you start that movement, I would I would always just have a big piece of D-loop material in my pocket yeah. in my release. And a lot of times, you know, if I was sitting somewhere or waiting around... Or, you know, I, I could really do it anywhere. I mean, you've kind of, I know your schedule is busy, but you're also not like on no. a line yeah. putting part, you know, putting parts together where someone's saying, did you get 500 knocks built this Sometimes hour? Or I'm something? just thinking about. And that, I... and honestly, you will learn, you will learn your stroke and you will learn timing and release manipulation by just handling it and and playing with it a lot. I mean, just, you know, I would grab my hoodie and make a little loop out of my freaking hoodie cord and just kind of hook my release on there and just kind of sit there and pull through my shot. And so you're going to have a video for this. Yep. Yeah. I'll definitely have one. What about like sizes? Do they, cause like I got a big hand. Jeez, dude. I know for How my does body. Your thumb go down that Dude, way? I don't know. It just is <laughs> genetic. Hold on, I'm taking a picture of your wacky thumb. <laughs> God dang. It's like a triple jointed thumb. You're like that's like a turkey claw. Dude. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. I gotta it's get your been, face. God dang. It's dude. been like that since birth. It's can, like a duck foot. I can palm a basketball. I played in high school, you know, a lot and I just. I bet you're like it just, your thumb I just is grab like, it, just bounce yeah, and grab it. Just, look like a damn velociraptor <laughs> with that thing. <laughs> but uh, but in general, when yeah, I, you've got like I don't think my hands are big for my size. Right. You know, you I, got I, big, big big hand, but you're a big dude. Yeah, I mean, you your hand is as big as mine, but you know, you're not you're not I'm as like tall. Five ten. Yeah, I um, I found that the whole size that that I have on these and actually universal. The, yeah, and so. The, the big reason why this thing took so long to come out with was because in the past, um, you're the head of a pivoting release or a hinge release. It, they were always a lot further out in front. So yep. the people wouldn't be able to take a hinge release and then take my, my trigger release and then be able to have the same position. Where right. It, see, now right. I've built this to where they're the same. And what's cool about this particular one is... There's actually two moons. You mm-hmm. see there's two moons inside oh, yeah. there. And these two screws that are on the end right here, that they actually, it's a threaded screw that are in there. Mm-hmm. And you know how on the moons, how they have all the little etches where normally you would kind of move your moon to a new location and lock it down? Mm-hmm. Those threads actually run on those notches. So you put these screws here, and as you turn the screw, it micro adjusts your moon for you. And one, adjust the head angle. So some people like to be a little bit more rolled back. Some people, I like mine rolled forward. So this one isn't like totally set for me right now. Oh, okay. But you essentially, you loosen these side screws and you'll loosen this screw underneath, which is forcing this cartridge up against the the moons. And then once you've taken the tension off the moons and then the cartridge, you actually can just micro adjust those and you can... You can either take the click out because essentially you've got two moons. So if you adjust, you can make a really long click or you Mm -hmm. can shorten it to, or you can put them even. You have no click. You can move them both simultaneously to where, you know, you can adjust your head angle. So you can actually lower that. I like mine laid right back. Um, And and what's this about? Like um, after it breaks, like way it tucks in like that? Well, this one's that. This is still. This part here actually isn't right on this one. Uh-huh. The ones that are at home, it'll actually self-close. It's supposed to have a magnet where is it just goes back. Is that to keep it back. quiet or? Huh? I mean, is, 
I, Normally, it'll actually, as soon as it'll flip back, it'll self-lock because okay. there's a magnet underneath. That'll got actually, it, got like, it. when it when it flips back, it automatically, the yeah. magnet sucks that loop back shut. So it's, it it's looks, pretty cool. It sounds like you thought of everything. because It's a combination of several releases. It's a combination of several of Carter's um, hinge releases mm-hmm. into one unit. But then, most importantly, the the finger hole and you know the shape is and then you know where your string would actually fit you're able to you could shoot a silverback a two smooth or a knock to it without having to change p pipe that's so big because um <clears throat> so i was doing the alpha bow hunting challenge where you do a little run you drop a sandbag you run back and you take a shot while you're breathing pretty heavy yep and you go to the next and it's a head-to-head race mm-hmm. with, so all these bow hunters are there and it's really fun and it's you go through a bracket yep. and uh <clears throat> so, and it's, uh, you know, it's just head-to-head rounds, so there's people watching, and there's pressure, you know, and and you're only against the guy on the other side of the course. Yep. And what I found um, when I was breathing heavy, again, sort of like when I've got adrenaline, you know, and then I got a hinge, I was having a hard time mm-hmm. getting it off before I need to take another breath, you know. They try to hold it, you know, and get the shot off because I'm, like, hyperventilating because yeah. I'm breathing too hard. And uh, and then kind of breathe and let it. Anyway, uh, I went on a quest to try to, I, at certain situations, I wanted to be able to run the, the wrist yeah. release. And I was pretty disappointed to find out that I couldn't hardly get anything that would work. Yeah. Like, I'd have to change my setup to shoot a different release. Yeah. Or I have to side in again. And so, but then I finally found a, a, rele- a wrist release and a hinge where they would shoot to the same spot. Oh, you're talking actual accuracy point of view, not necessarily pee pipe and stuff. Mm-hmm. Just where, point of impact. Yes. Yeah. Because, I mean, some some releases open up in, some open out, some open in the center. <clears throat> and all those are essentially creating a different path of direction for the string as it's leaving the bow, you know, or... Especially facial pressures. Like some people, when they get a wrist strap, they just automatically want to just tuck in back there. And when you do that, you're going to find, man, my peep needs to be higher. Because a lot of people want to tuck in. That peep ends up being higher. But the arrow shaft becomes lower on the face, Mm. which I'm not a big fan of. But that's the other thing, too, is, you know, there's a fine line between some of these, like, training things. And, I mean, there is some... There's some awesome dudes doing some really cool, like, you know, train to hunt and that sort of thing. But there's, you know, I would like to do that. Like, if I did it, I would do it for a conditioning. Like, mentality-wise, I would say I'm doing this from a conditioning point of view and not a scoring point of view. Right. I would, like, I would be adamant with myself about that because well, I did these that. little challenges, they... They are enablers to Bad. Tar- target panic. That's, and, and when I was at the Total Archery Challenge, I was like, I, I, I was shooting with Cam. We were going around the whole course, and and uh, and I had uh, shot incredible with the with the hinge mm-hmm. on a couple of Total Archery ch- Challenge courses mm-hmm. leading up to this one in Snowbird. Got there with Cam and was just doing great, and then halfway through the course, just started to melt down. And I really wanted to just switch to a trigger or the, to the hint, to the wrist. So you were actually just feeling anticipation, like you mm-hmm. could feel like the tremors coming. And then I just couldn't get the release to go off. It seemed like it was I was under tension, and and it happened a few you more just times. Need the, you need the right person to where when that happens, you know, you, key into I like, it. Well, I like to be like this little voice and just. When I see that happen, you almost need this little voice. It's just like, dude, everything's cool. Like, yeah. what's the process? You know what to do. Here's, you know, let's break it down to this. And um, with Andy, that's one thing. That's why he was just like, I think he did that Alberta hunt with me. And I knew that he would be, I knew Joe Rogan would be great for archery and bow hunting. Yeah. Like in the world. And I know Andy's also someone in that category. He's good for Absolutely. our sport. So I really wanted him to do it to where he had a good time and he enjoyed it. So I really wanted to be there because I knew 
you know, those first times you get jacked up. So, I mean, you know, he was there and I knew he was excited and, you know, he shot, um, two bears on the ground, um, with a silver back had never even, I don't think he'd ever seen a bear like that before. Yeah. And just, um, and that's actually going to be our second film. The first film, I kind of intentionally wanted there to be no success in this first film because Kill Cliff is kind of, they're really wanting this hardcore outdoor community to see their product as like, you know, a recovery type product, not yeah. an energy product. Um, so it's cool that they're kind of getting in from that aspect. And there's so many CrossFitters that are into like super clean health, super clean Absolutely. eating. Um, you know, there's just this push right there. So every outside company that is willing to like look at this stuff with an open mind, I want to just embrace that. Any but, mainstream company we need yeah, on our side. Yeah, that was one thing too. I know, um, you know, there, there's been people, there's, I don't know how to say it the right way, but, you know, with clothing and camo companies, that's like there used to just be Matthews, PSE, Hoyt, like, you know, and then the Botech came in. So, you know, it's just like Bud Light, Miller Light, right. Coors, right? Dodge, Chevy. Yeah. Well, now we've got like a whole new category. Now you've got the guys that are like, you know, they're not only arguing about their beer, but then they're saying, well, I want to chew. <laughs> skull i like copenhagen you know yeah, yeah it's like in that now there's that same thing with with sick ua mm -hmm. and i'm a ua person and i've been there a long time and i really like it and i know that there's there's been some some unfair stuff in the industry i think because people were never really given the whole picture because it, it wouldn't have been the best for our sport if the whole picture came out so they took some slack there, but in the end, that is a major plus to to our sport for a company that's that big to be in the yeah. hunting world. Aaron and I had uh, Josh and Sarah Bomar on this podcast. Mm -hmm. I did, and then uh, we did a recap of that podcast afterward, and we were pretty clear about our stance, and that was that. Um basically that ua has an incredible mainstream reach yep. to the outside world mm -hmm. and whether we like to admit it or not hunting is not looked upon as mainstream nope and so we kind of live in these bubbles where we think it's normal or mainstream but it's not and and when you have a company that is as as globally recognized and yep. as large as as Under Armour, and, and, th and that is not not known for hunting mm -hmm. exactly, right, yeah. in the mainstream space, when they say, we have a whole hunting line mm -hmm. and we, we support this, it legitimizes hunting in yeah. a mainstream way, unlike, unlike what Sitka can do. And I don't think people realize that, like, if you go to UA.com, some people are upset that UA Hunt doesn't have their own division. And in a way, it's hard to find. But it, an, another side to that is when you go to Under Armour and click sports, I mean, you have golf, surfing, skiing, yeah. basketball, football, you know, cross training, running, hunting. Like, that's yeah. a pretty dang cool thing Absolutely. to have and uh i don't know i think it's i think it's so important for you know um well like the guy I was talking with the guys at black rifle coffee and they told me they're like hey we we really we're like our eyes are totally open to this to the bow hunting crowd they said like the archery part they're like we didn't realize how big archery was they're like obviously we're black rifle but they're like yeah you guys have a big like they're, and it's because they hear, they see someone like Rogan yeah. shooting, you know, they got Andy Stump, who's this crazy freaking base jump, <laughs> you know, wingsuit Remarkable flyer. Human I was going to show you a shot too. I wanted to show you this. This will be in the, in the second film, but I'm pretty, in, I told him, I said, dude, this is, this is, um, pretty dang impressive. This is, this is Andy's, uh, spot and stock 
black bear with a silver back. Ooh. <laughs> do you get a tension release? Dang, dude. First time being in front of a black bear and just make it just draw him back. I saw him just anchor in, looking through that peep. I saw him level that bow up. Let, I could hear him let off that safety. See, and he just starts it takes, just starts pulling it through. It takes so much discipline. That's what I was going to say about the shoots. Uh, there were times where I wanted to fall back to my comfort zone uh-huh. and yep. just grab the release I've shot for 10 years. Yeah. And I made myself made myself i'm like no i just left it at home and i made myself use a hinge over and over and over and over all all summer all spring and then when it came to doing some of these challenges it was brutal because i would in the short term do better Mm -hmm. more consistently with with punching it the way i've done it a long time but long term it was not making me a better shooter especially once i reached beyond 30 or 40 yards there's yeah. no comparison. Yeah. And so I started to, uh, that's when I was like, I'm only going to hunt with a hinge during hunting season as well. And I made it almost through the end of the season before I switched and started using the wrist. And I was with David Brinker in Alberta. Yeah. And David had a horrible problem with, with target panic and to where he was ready to quit. Mm-hmm. And he got a hinge and started learning with that and he's like this is saving my 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 archery life like yeah because people are ready to give up he's ready to like, give up some people legitimately are ready to give and up and i'm like well david but what about when the wind's blowing really hard and you've got this shot and this shot well i know like it's tough to make with a hinge and he's like i i'm not taking that shot yeah and that's a, that's I my mean, rule that's, yeah that's a good rule too you know i wish most i wish more people would would really go into like shoots and I don't know, you know, you go to a tournament or you practice. I just wish there was less emphasis on prize and outcome or perform. Like I've, I always tell people, I'm like, I only watch and worry about the process. Like I know, I know that if you will do my process and just focus on your process, the prize the outcome come. that all that all totally takes care of itself but you know learning these small things like you know toting around a release and a string and just you know working on being comfortable with that thing you know getting to that click and then realizing okay how aggressive can i actually be not only pulling but relaxing until that goes off or even get to the point where it's like i'm going to try taking the click out and you know and you work on it enough with the string to where you're not worried about anything and just be like man, I really got the feel for this. And then, you know, start doing practices where you're like, you know, I just want to start, I want to put on a song that I like where I can just get in this zone and just find this stroke where I'm just going through this rhythm and going through this rhythm. And then the next time you go to an event like Total Archery Challenge, you know, make your goals clear. I There's a lot of tournaments that I would go to and people would say, you know, how you feeling, dud? And I'd say, I'm working on some things. I've got, you know, I got, I've got some important goals for myself this week. And they're like, well, hope, you know, counting on you to win. And I, you know, I just tell them, well, I've got, I've got other things I need to, to work on first. And, you know, and I knew there's at times there's small little hiccups in my shot that you need to get through that. And then the wins come, you know, your Mm -hmm. success comes the same. And it's the same with hunting. When I go there and I'm really just stroking at home you know, shooting with just really good rhythm to where I know, you know, almost within four to five minutes, if I go and shoot a hundred arrows, I can have a hundred arrow practice within four to five minutes. You know, if I put on a good album or my playlist and just start going, get three down there, go down, pull, 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 come back, load them, reset my stance, look down, go through. So, I mean, like those, those videos that I've put on my YouTube channel of just practice sessions. Yeah. I'm not wanting to just show someone, hey, here's me shooting, you know, a 300. I want people to look at it and be like, okay, like, think about it as what what is he thinking about? Mm-hmm. How's the timing on this? Like, is his movement continual? Is his movement the same all the time? That is a crazy beard, isn't Dude, it? Dude, that is like, Man. <laughs> that's down to his crotch. <laughs> Man, that sucker! You could get some slinging going on with that thing. 
Well, hey, I'm yeah. I think we got to rock and I think roll. I'm huh? late for uh, my Hoyt my Hoyt booth appearance. Well, dude, I appreciate it. I'm excited about uh, the Kill Cliff film. I want to go watch that. Yeah, well, and, uh, we'll we'll put it on a uh, TV tonight at um, at Traeger. Awesome. Yeah, we can put it on a TV there see and that. let you guys see it. I'm I'm also excited. They're involved in archery and and promoting what we do. Yeah, just seeing it as um, they're just seeing it as a life. Well, you know what's cool. It's a whole different subject, but when a company like that would have looked at archery or bow hunting 10 years ago, they would have looked at it as not probably a category that fits their athlete mold. Yeah. Whereas now, you know, someone like, uh, someone like, you know, the president of Killcliffe could come to something like this and walk around or he could watch a few videos and, you know, he could watch a video shooting and see how accurate someone is. And then all of a sudden he sees like Joe Rogan shooting, or then he can see, you know, next recommendation in his YouTube film, he sees some freaking archer, you know, a total archery challenge, or then he sees a train, you know. A, oh yeah. And, and he, you see these guys that are like toting sandbags around going into head to head match. And it's like, wait a minute, <laughs> this is like CrossFit. I mean, I don't want to take anything away from the CrossFit guys. That's not totally fair, but. It's a, you know, this is an athletic endeavor with a weapon. Yeah. And so that's the draw, too. We've done a good job at becoming healthier as a community, like physically Mm. healthier, eating cleaner, you know, better supplements. People are working out. People are doing fitness just as much or more than practicing. And then not just showing up on the mountain opening day in, like, bad shape. I mean, people are almost in better shape than they need to be to hunt which is a good position but that's Absolutely. that's where we've moved to yep yep well john thank you buddy appreciate cool, it yeah appreciate it big time get that weird thumb checked out <laughs> <laughs> all right man stay gritty yep despite our ever-changing ever indignant world with its growing ignorance of and indifference to the ways of the wild i remain a predator pitying those who revel in artificiality and synthetic success while regarding me and my kind as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood. I stalk a real world of dark wood and tall grass stirred by a restless wind blowing across sunlit water and beneath star-strewn sky. And on those occasions when I choose to kill, to claim some small part of nature's bounty for my own, I do so by choice, quickly, with the learned efficiency of a skilled hunter. Further, in my heart and mind, I know the truth and make no apologies for my actions or my place in time. Others around me may opt to eat only plants, nuts, and fruits. Still others may employ faceless strangers to procure their meats, their leather, their feathers, and all those niceties and necessities of life. Such is their right, of course, and I wish them well. All I ask in return is no one begrudge me, and all of us who may answer the primordial stirrings within our hunter's souls, my right to do some of these things myself. What you just heard is a quote from M.R. James. We truly live in a world that is largely ignorant and indifferent to the ways of the wild. And although some regard us as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood, we have the opportunity to change the way these people view the hunter and the hunt. We can share our experiences and nature's bounty with those who employ these faceless strangers. And by so doing, we make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the wild animals in the wild places we care so deeply about. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting and the outdoors. Our wild animals and our wild places depend on it. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. (laughs) 